Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar uh, Cultural Diplomacy in Times of Conflict, organized within the framework of uh, Rome Med 2023. Uh, this is a webinar which uh, um, anticipates the larger conference, which will be organized between the 2 and the 2nd second, the second and the 4th of November uh, later this year. So I'm very happy that we have this uh, chance to discuss cultural diplomacy um, uh, and its role uh, in, uh, uh, in mediation uh, of conflict, but also uh, in the escalation and in uh, cooperation uh, between countries and regional integration. To discuss this important matter, we have uh, um, a distinguished, um, uh, distinguished speakers, which I will introduce, um, uh, Tamara Chalabi, who is the uh, co-founder of the Roya Foundation and also curator of the Iraq Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Then we have Anna Sidorenko, who is the head of the Cultural Heritage Protection Unit at UNESCO. And finally, uh, Valerie Freeland, who is the executive director of Alif uh, Foundation. Uh, so thank you for uh, joining uh, this discussion and let me just uh, without further ado start uh, uh, with, uh, with you Tam Tamara. Um, uh, I wanted uh, um, a little bit to explore with you this idea of how actually um, we can bring uh, the heritage from the past as a tool to actually confront the challenges of today politics and how you have done so, you have tried to do so in your experience at the Roya Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for having me um, on this panel. Um, so um, I, I suppose I, I would define myself within the panel as, as the, the one uh, participant who is um, technically um, involved in a, in a small um, organization that is, you know, civil society run, meaning we are a, a group of co-founders that came together to set this up. And we, um, struggle tremendously to exist, whether it is uh, in, you know, in, in a very existential way, whether it is, it is through um, participating and um, um, performing, I mean, through working with our artists, we are mostly focused on visual arts coming out of Iraq and connecting Iraq with the wider world as a bridge, if you like, but also financially. So from my perspective, um, I think one thing I want to raise before we start or as a kind of a, a leading point is the terminology and the problematics of talking about cultural diplomacy, um, which technically can also be called soft power can, you know, I mean, it is. Um, it, it has different meanings, but in the in, in the definition of cultural diplomacy, I think there is if there's a suggestion of a state role and a hierarchical structure that I think is extremely problematic um, as far as dealing with uh, situations um, to do with culture, particularly in areas of conflict, which already have a imbalanced situation connecting to that state and that location, et cetera. Now, coming to your specific question on heritage, uh, which is a, with a capital H, which is a very loaded subject, um, of course, I can speak anecdotally of the various projects that we have done directly linked to heritage. But I would say that one of the biggest challenges that we face in dealing with living contemporary uh, creatives, artists who are working and reacting today in environments in a world that is you know, collapsing around them, challenging their very existence as human beings, where their artistic practice is a way of actually connecting and engaging with the world. Um, and the, 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 the tremendous challenge faced when dealing with uh, the greatest respect for uh, institutions like UNESCO, for example, and even uh, the Ella Foundation, where heritage is treated, um, I mean, and not uniquely to you, but in general, talking about state organizations where heritage with a capital H is, is, is a very, uh, almost uh, how to put it, it is an abstract context where it is about simply, you know, the preservation or the rebuilding of certain, uh, you know, monuments, buildings, uh, uh, um, uh, archaeological sites that are ruined, but that don't really engage with a local community, with a local, uh, I mean, beyond the local community, it's not just about an archaeologist 
and the people building it, but with creatives, with artists from those societies that actually are very much interested in being part of that conversation. And here I will bring a, a more anecdotal direct example for, you know, that we have uh, as a foundation been very involved in, uh, starting with uh, 2014 when ISIS came into, you know, took over Mosul and we had the calamity that we had in, in Iraq with the internally displaced, the, the, the horrors that were inflicted on the Yazidi communities and the Christian communities, in fact, many other communities too. And we, as a foundation preparing for the 2015 Venice Biennale, which again is a, a whole other thing, because that is usually the remit of a state of a ministry of culture, which in our case um, gives us just a piece of paper and we have to take care of absolutely everything else. But where we, we basically created programs that were um, connected to uh, people in the camps that I don't want to just call refugees or internally displaced to and international artists, for example, um, to do these workshops, to connect, to be able to bring that local personal experience in a way that can be part of a wider, uh, what I would call artistic canon. I mean, we, we had a collaboration with Ai Weiwei with a book called Traces of Survival, we then had a very long collaboration with Francis Alice, um, who um, uh, focuses uh, more on, on, on children and children's games uh, in this context. But what I'm trying to get at also in terms of the Iraqi artists that we have worked with, who have engaged directly with uh, certain elements of, let's say, this conflict or this situation, particularly, I, I think of one artist called Akam Sheikh Hadi, who we supported tremendously in going into Mosul and uh, creating a project around the museum in Mosul in, in connecting, you know, the destroyed town of Khursabad with the uh, Khursabad pavilion at the Louvre in Paris. I mean, all the work that he's created, which is contemporary, but very much dealing with the whole issue of identity and heritage, that really doesn't get to see the light of day because we are... You know, we are a not-for-profit foundation. We don't have a gallery. We don't, I mean, we have a gallery and small space in Baghdad, but we're not part of a, and we cannot communicate with you as, as large state entities because our projects are, let's say, um, localized or small or so on, which I technically, I mean, I'm assuming that's the idea, but I, I, I would disagree because I think the more that you're able to engage local communities and particularly artists and creatives, within a wider, and I don't want to just say local, but also international uh, platform, the more you're going to be able to uh, 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 reach, you know, uh, have greater communication and therefore, you know, achieve a, a, a better understanding of these, you know, peoples of the conflict of, I mean, it, it's, it's a whole other level that I think is 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 unfortunately not being um, uh, exploited, for lack of a better word, right now enough. Thank you, Tamara. And I think that this point of uh, connecting, uh, en engaging uh, the um, individuals of the local community with elements of the heritage, uh, it's it's essential in the prospect of the reconciliation in Iraq. But I wanted to link it also to the issue of protection and go uh, with this uh, to, to Anna Sderenko, uh, who, to, I mean, to ask her really what, how, I mean, how to engage local communities also in protection, how to go beyond the state top-down <laughs> engagement with the heritage that Tamara was, was pointing at. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria, and uh, good afternoon to all participants. Thank you for inviting UNESCO in this important uh, preparatory meeting um, to discuss this, uh, uh, the protection of cultural heritage and also the, the impact and the from conflict and the role of the community across this. Um, I, maybe I can uh, start by illustrating like the three levels of pillars. Of course, the first one is the programmatic level, as UNESCO is the only UN specialized agency. So, and now we in the domain of protection of cultural heritage, but also we take the cultural heritage not in separate way. Education, science, and the social science are very important uh, 
uh, contributors, comprehensive contributors in this uh, heritage protection uh, area. The second level is also the uh, the, the governance and the, the facility we have in um, facilitating the policy development, but also the normative instrument development, but of course the engagement with different kinds of partners. And in governance, we know that the actors are very important from state uh, to the UN system, but also the community. And we have uh, different instruments and different um, programs in, which exist to involve the communities more and more at the programmatic levels, but also in the governance process. But, uh, for example, I would like maybe start by uh, saying a few words on the recent adoption of the Mondial Declaration. Uh, in which uh, 150 countries participate and, and which recognize for the first time culture as a global public good. And uh, this uh, declaration also reflects the country's agreement on a common roadmap to strengthening public policy in this field. And of course, we set some, we have not, we have not some set of uh, cultural rights. And of course, the community uh, participation in this roadmap implementations. Um, one of the main role playing in that process. But also that's the um, from the perspective of the um, recovery and the community resilience. Uh, they the the um, now we are looking you know, more in details on the how the um, organize the identity uh, and the impact of the destruction of this um, we create this identity uh, approach uh, to promote dialogue and to enhance the possible uh, reconciliation between different uh, uh, different uh, parties involved in some conflicts. But for example, what this could be uh, provide some uh, figures is the um, from the analytical reports of the state of conservation of more of the thousands of war heritage properties, uh, the uh, conflicts constitutes a major threat. And they, mostly the armed conflicts and also civil uh, unrest remind one of the main reasons why property has been started on the UNESCO list of war heritage in danger. And so the Mondia Corporation, the ministers of culture, of of the first uh, of uh, state level recognized and related the uh, the, the importance to protect and prevent the, the the conflicts. So, what could be the preventive measures in, um, in which could be included in the policy and the state on at the state level? But of course, that I would like maybe also mention that the um, there is uh, some new initiatives uh, launched by UNESCO. One of the the initiative on heritage of religious interest, which is the uh, recognize also the um, role of the religious community in protection of cultural heritage. There is the 2010 declaration um, adopted during the conference in 2010 in Kiev, in Ukraine, already um, some years ago. And now this declaration is one of the peers of the UN resolution adopted in 2021 on protection of the religious sites against destruction. And of course, the, when we are talking speaking of religious sites, the main role is the community and place in there. This is because this religious sites belong to the religious community. And this is the one of the answer. And the second one, from the normative perspective, I would like also to maybe say some few introductory words on the importance of the 1954 Hague Convention for the protection of cultural heritage in the event of armed conflict. Um, this convention is not only for uh, protection of cultural heritage during the conflict area, but also to uh, prevent conflict using the different uh, tools and materials from involving the civil society, but also the military and police security professionals in all the civil process to prevent conflict and if conflicts happen, to, to act during the conflict and if I recall the 
And the last one is the recent program initiative, recent program launched by the second protocol to the Hague Convention on Heritage for Peace. And one of the first examples I would like to mention is the ongoing project in Ukraine, which is the um, which was launched in Lviv to create to establish the culture hub, uh, which will provide like a platform for community to to recover from the ongoing on conflict to accompany them during the conflict, but also to prepare the pathway for the next uh, recovery process. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. And I think that uh, from what you uh, also shared, it, it's it's clear that uh, um, uh, I mean the legal framework it's there for protection, but also what uh, to me at least as an external observer. Um, it's obvious that it's also more and more uh, difficult to actually uh, have the parties to um, uh, to uh, to adhere to this to these legislations. Also, because uh, cultural uh, uh, heritage is also mobilized by the parties in conflict as a tool to deepen division sometimes. Um, so, on, with this, um, and therefore this. It, increasingly expose heritage to also more uh, more destruction and division. So with this, I would like to um, actually hand over the floor to um, uh, uh, Mr. Valerie Freeland. And uh, um, uh, for maybe you can share with us a little bit the experience that you had on the role of cultural heritage in an active conflict, uh, like the uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, and what actually has been Aleph's uh, uh, attempt while um, aiming at uh, protecting heritage in this specific uh, context. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, just uh, to get back to the definition of cultural diplomacy, I just want to underline that uh, in cultural diplomacy, of course, you have a lot of culture, but you also have a lot of diplomacy, and, and that means that it's very political. When we talk about cultural heritage, we talk about political issue, political instruments. It's it's not only, uh, it hasn't uh, uh, only a cultural dimension. We It's uh, more political than cultural, I would say. So uh, regarding uh, what we try to do, what we have tried to do for a year in, in Ukraine, um, we have tried to contribute to, pre to the preservation of the Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, in three directions. First, we have tried to, to develop uh, the protection of, of the collection of museums, of archives and, and uh, libraries in the old countries, because I would say, even if it's sometimes very complicated to work in, in the, uh, during a conflict, it was to some extent the easier, easier things to do, you know, because protecting a collection, it's a bit easier to protect a monument or a site. So we have tried to, to do that and we have been able with very direct and concrete uh, um, relationship with the Ukrainian uh, uh, professionals. Uh, we definitely work with Ukrainian professionals. We uh, have been able to support more than 160 uh, cultural institutions. That means that we were able to help them protect with equipment, materials, and so on, their, their collection in Kiev, in Odessa, in, in Lviv, in the East part, and so on. But we also have to try to contribute to the protection of sites and monuments, even if I've already said it, it's very challenging, through one of one of the the instruments is the three dimension uh, documentation and so that's what we have tried to do with 40 monuments in in Ukraine to be able to finance 3d documentation for uh, for these monuments and third it was also key for us to be along with the professional uh, the Ukrainian professional so uh, we developed with another NGO Europa Nostra uh, an instrument to uh, uh, give small grants to a professional who are fully involved in the protection of their cultural heritage to help them uh, face uh, uh, the uh, cut down of, of salaries and, and so on. So that's part of the instrument we have tried to develop during uh, the, the last year uh, to help uh, protect the cultural uh, heritage in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much. And I think that the, the the example of Ukraine also, I mean, you didn't touch on this, but maybe later you will. It also shows really as a being a very like 
culturally divisive conflict. So I will ask you later about this. But from an active conflict, I want to jump back to some, to Tamara and ask her, um, on the contrary, settings where cultural heritage can be really a platform for consolidating um, regional integration, societal interconnection. Um, when it comes, for example, to the Middle East, you had uh, one panel, um, one one uh, pavilion initiative, uh, Heartbreaks at the Venice Biennale, who really looked at the different traumas of the Middle Eastern society from the East Mediterranean to the West. So is it that cultural heritage can be really a sort of conduit for this societal interconnection, diplomacy speed up uh, for regional integration in the Middle East? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. Yes, I, I absolutely think it can be. Also, I just wanted to thank the, the previous speakers. I thank you, Valerie, in particular for explaining what you've been doing in uh, in the Ukraine. It's very interesting, and I would say it's extremely valuable. But it also raises a point for me that that um, uh, the contrast, let's say, of being able to act in a place like Ukraine, which, as you say, is naturally extremely divisive and, and quite lethal compared to regions of the Middle East that have been living through a protracted conflict. So again, the whole notion of conflict and where does it end and what you do beyond, you know, the, the point of, you know, violence, but where you still have the impact of conflict and trauma. And so one of the things that I was interested in doing in connection, sorry, just to, as a, to backtrack, I, I, I did not mention that, you know, in 2017, the National Pavilion of Iraq, which I co-curated, and, um, and, and, and I mean, I, you know, in, in Venice, and, and kind of like you know, commissioned from A to Z, was called Archaic, and it was uh, in fact an interaction between um, uh, forty pieces of antiquity that we uh, painstakingly borrowed from the Iraq Museum alongside 10 uh, contemporary artists and uh, commissioned works in conversation. So picking themes within the archaic uh, as a subject that correlated things to do with, uh, you know, the id uh, as opposed to, you know, uh, um, very substance, like human, human um, condition elements, like, you know, the hunt, like um, music, like water, like the earth. I mean, very basic elements technically, but also very connected. And that conversation that was created in this pavilion, which went on for seven months, was, was an extremely fruitful one, which led to a wonderful collection of, of, of you know, conferences, um, articles, et cetera, and so forth. I mean, I you know, it, it had a big, big impact. And connecting to this, I then was think, thought that, you know, and also reflecting my own heritage as being both Iraqi and Lebanese, um, the fact that there was a commonality that, that, okay, I mean, okay, Iraq is slightly out of it, but it's still connected to the Levant. I mean, in terms of a, um, 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 if you like, pan-Mediterranean story and, 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 and created a pavilion in Venice, a collateral pavilion called the Heartbreak Pavilion, which took elements that I think are so fundamental from literature, so from a collective heritage. In this case, it was Virgil's Dido and Aeneas as a story. Um, and from history, which dealt with, uh, you know, these empires to do with, you know, Phoenicia, to do with uh, ancient Rome, to do with ancient Greece, etc. And created a storyline around the theme of heartbreak from the very, interpreting it out of the story of, of Virgil, but also of this universal story or myth, if you like, of Dido and Aeneas, and picked artists along this road, this journey that starts in, 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 in the case of this exhibition, started all the way in Iran and ended up in Rome, actually going through um, um, in, uh, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon. Um, uh, we had Palestine. Um, we had um, Greece. Uh, Tunisia, um, also actually somebody from Sarajevo, and all the way to uh, you know a Baroque painting of Dido and Aeneas that came in from Napoli. And and the the point I'm getting at with this and and what the exhibition intends intended and and I think achieved in doing and what I think is an example or a, that can be a template that can be followed again and again in in extremely diverse and creative ways is exactly that commonality of heritage through narrative, through storytelling of artists today, 
responding so that the, the heartbreak of, of, of communicating heartbreak for, for an artist working on maps in Sarajevo is very different from the artist who was born in Damascus and who did the whole work with embroidery on Palmyra and the prison of Palmyra. Again, with the artist coming out of Beirut, who is a complete, uh, in a sense, still living in the conflict of the civil war already now finished 30 years ago. And I mean, but still we're seeing the, the effects today. So, so again, while I think what, what is being done with, you know, what, what you discussed with UNESCO, the projects you're doing and, and that are also very legislative and, and reflect a certain state structure, but also what, what uh, Elif is doing, I think there needs to be also a balance in terms of engaging and, and, and activating that heritage in a, in, action, in, in a proactive, what I would call living culture way. So in addition to protecting these museums, in addition to, and, and, and as I said, I, I don't want to get into this, but you know, I think Ukraine is also, uh, you started at a very different level um, of let's say civil society and health, quote unquote, than Iraq or Syria, let's say, which, uh, this, which where erosion has already taken place over decades and decades. So I just, my point is that I think there needs to be, through the use of heritage, I believe it's a very good positive entry point. Actually, uh, there is a universality to it that speaks in language, in music, in literature. I mean, I work with visual arts, so that's, you know, but they can all be connected. I mean, and in a contemporary context that actually creates a dialogue and, 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 a, and that is as relevant and as important today particularly when you want to engage younger generations, when you want to bring different kinds of people together, is as important um, as, as protecting and rebuilding a monument. It is, and that interaction and that idea of what that artist can do with that monument. I mean, beyond obviously the restoration and the, the very strict, if you like, um, uh, uh, professional element of that. Yeah. Thank you, Tamara. And I will uh, just hand over to Anna to react to this. So how, I mean, uh, I know you are sitting in a big structure <laughs> with a lot of legislations, but how to really, uh, what are the strategic guidelines to make heritage alive, but not just buried in the past? If you, if you can share it with us, some ideas also out of the box. Thank you, Maria, and thank you for my colleagues and previous speakers, uh, maybe with three examples. I will start with three examples. So the first one, um, an example which help us to define the, the real impact of uh, conflict on the armed conflict on, on heritage building, and to how to define the what it could be uh, as a tools helping the community to be recognized as victims. The, for example, the first is the, um, during the uh, Balkan Wars, uh, the, the whole process, the whole reflection conducted at the institutional levels uh, of the experts and research to revive the 1954 Hague Convention and to include additional protocol, uh, additional instruments which help to recognize destruction of cultural heritage as war crime. This is the, of course, the community and the civil society in Jew, they are working on the ground. And in parallel with this, the analysis help to prevent in, to the, the future destruction. So this is the, the example also more operational one conducted within the auspice of UNESCO is the construction of the old bridge of Mosta, the Mosta Herzegovina, which its reopening and its inscription of the UNESCO War Heritage Fees contributed largely contributed to the reconciliation of our divided people. And also it set us the precedent in the peace building process. So we also this the lesson learned component is very important what is the good help, but what we can learn from the world. The, the second one uh, example is, of course, is the case of the destruction of uh, mosques and uh, religious monuments in Mali, in Timbuktu. And now, they quite recently, uh, 
we signed an agreement with Trump for, uh, Trust Fund for Victims of the International We signed this agreement to work with victims and to develop the rehabilitation of the mausoleums and mosques with the full involvement of the, of the communities. So this is the one specific uh, example, which also the first case from the institutional and from the legal instruments, the recognition and the conditions of the OMD case, which help to learn lesson for, for the future um, the search of evidence from destruction of heritage. And of course, the one of the flagship uh, project uh, recently conducted uh, by UNESCO in the old city of Mosul, which also helped through the uh, restoration, through the re uh, reconstruction of famous mosques, minarets, and churches to prepare the, the recovery and reconciliation process. So, this is the, the, the main example, I would like to say, how the closely interlinked to institutional and to the value of the people concerned with the reconciliation phase and the recognition of victims. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, and thank you, Anna. And I think that uh, really, when uh, you connect cultural heritage with war crime, we are really entering into the domain of approaching cultural heritage uh, humanly, you know, the human approach to cultural heritage, which I think is a discussion which started a few years back, but still there is so much to do to unpack what does it mean, this human approach to cultural heritage. These are not just stones. And with this, uh, let me come back to Valerie with this. Uh, I mean, both uh, in the um, case of Ukraine, but also other conflicts that you have seen uh, as a director of Alif, but also as a diplomat, uh, exactly how can you evaluate the um, uh, importance of heritage in both deepening division, but also again, bridge, bridging pieces, uh, because uh, bridging uh, peace. And, uh, and and I say this really as a diplomat as well, because you have a background as diplomat. So if you can share with us your experience. Sorry. Um, yes, I try to be diplomat. Um, so uh, I would like to, to get back to what Tamara says said just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, first of all, we are very active in, 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 in Ukraine and we have been very active for a year in Ukraine, but we are also very active in the Middle East and, and Iraq is our first uh, countries of intervention. So we are very active in Iraq. We have a lot of projects, uh, including in Mosul, uh, including with UNESCO. And, and for us, it's definitely a priority because we were created because of what happened in the Middle East and in the, in the Sahel region a, a couple of, year, of years ago. Second point, I, I fully understand the point raised by uh, Tamaha regarding the necessity to, to, see the, to see men and women and women and men behind the stone and to work with civil society, to work with uh, people and so on. It is true, and that's what we try to do, but we also mustn't forget the cultural heritage because you know most uh, if alif was created it also because we had the feeling a couple of years ago that we were spending money on program but we didn't see the concrete uh, result on the cultural heritage and so that's the reason why we also have a, a, at alif an approach before after and and to me it's, it, it's very important because let me just uh, underline one point when notre dame uh, uh, burned uh, two or three years ago, no one said how many uh, jobs it will create, the restoration of, of, of Notre Dame, how many people will be involved in the restoration, how many, how many communities will be involved in the restoration. We just wanted to restore Notre Dame because Notre Dame is a main cultural heritage of France and, and, and worldwide. So we have to do the same with uh, uh, underdeveloped and developing countries. We have to consider that, that their cultural heritage have uh, um, an importance by themselves, not only because they are part of a community, part of of us, by themselves for all of us, you know. So that is why, I, you know, I, I'm a bit. Sometimes, you know, I think it's a bit um, uh, neo-colonial to say, "Oh, 
uh, you know, we we don't we 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 don't talk about the, the the communities in Paris when we talk about the cultural heritage protection in Paris. But we always talk about the communities in in Iraq, in in uh, uh, wherever you want. W what does it mean? In me, this cultural heritage is as important as the cultural heritage in 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 uh, in in, in uh, Western countries. But it's a point. I, I think it's interesting because. Uh, there's not so many people who underline this this, this point. So your, to get to go back to your question, uh, Maria, uh, there is one example which is very interesting, and that's the reason why we invited them at our uh, forum in Abu Dhabi uh, uh, three weeks ago. That's what happened in Cyprus. In Cyprus, they created a couple of years ago uh, a, a technical committee, and it's important to say that it's a technical committee uh, uh, bringing together uh, the Turkish and, and the uh, uh, Greek uh, Cypriot communities, and they work on cultural heritage protection, and they have been able, with the support of UNDP and, and the EU, to work on more than 100 uh, sites. Uh, Tamara, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, for, uh, thank you Valerie, uh, because you wanted to answer this, uh, but also you see in the box there are also other questions from the public, because we have 10 minutes left, uh, specifically on the initiatives uh, that have been done by European institutions like the Louvre Museum in establishing branches uh, in the Gulf, uh, and uh, what does it mean this for the broader um, uh, relations between, uh, say, Europe and these countries? But anyway, I don't want to divert you from uh, responding directly to, to, to Valerie, please. Microphone. Hmm? So, uh, yeah, I wanted to, I'm glad you mentioned, first of all, I, I, the idea is, is that I, I think there needs to be, if you like, an exchange and a balance. And at the moment, I don't think there is balance. I, I'm not, and so the idea was not to put what the work of Alif does, uh, uh, you know, to, 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 to put you uh, at, on the defensive. And I'm very aware of what you're doing in Mosul. And I know that's the first port of call, actually. Um, so thank you for that. However, um, I think, you mentioned a very key word, which which was neo-colonial. I would probably call it post-colonial. And I think there's a huge problematic in the way that, um, uh, and here I'm not specifically referring to um, Elif, by the way, I'm just talking about the role of, 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 of states uh, um, and their representatives in, in local contexts like Ukraine, like Iran. I mean, okay, I, I, I'm not gonna speak on, on, on Ukraine. I don't have the experience, but, but certainly the Middle East where, uh, I would say um, at least not the Gulf, the Levant, the conflict with the Middle East and um, regions, I mean, and, and where, where the post-colonial attitude, I think, of, of diplomacy that is uh, manifested in things like the, uh, in no particular order, you know, the Goethe Institute, the Institut Francais, the British Council, the, all of these local, et cetera, that promote local activity and local subjects where with all due respect, it's very much the attitude of c'est bien pour l'Orient, you know, where the standards are really poor, where nine out of 10, let's say the, the, the cultural activity is not of, of level and is not of, you know, it, it's not going anywhere. It's just about spending a budget locally and engaging and creating some buzz locally. And when you connect it to Paris and you say you don't speak the same thing about Paris, you're absolutely right. But in Paris, you have a healthy art ecosystem. You have art schools. You have artists who can maybe not entirely live out of their art, but who can exhibit, who can be recognized, who are part of galleries. None of this is available on a, on a, on a scale. On a, I mean, and if it is, it is extremely uh, uh, disabled in a place like Iraq or Syria, and increasingly in a place like Lebanon, when in fact, you know, there's a lot, uh, you know, of, of, of personal initiative. It's also that no one size fits all. I mean, the cultural dynamic in a place like Iraq that has always been very etatist is very different, where civil society is much weaker than a place like Lebanon, historically, I mean, you know. Uh, so what I'm saying is that I think, and where I guess the point that, where I think a better dialogue needs to happen between people like me and 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 practitioners like in me and foundations like the Ruya Foundations and you, is the fact that you guys have tremendous. It's 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 you know, to be very blunt, you have incredible access to money because you are state supported. We we struggle to exist, and I think there could be a way in which there is a conversation and a dialogue 
um, and that produces results in the form of exhibitions, films, books, etc., that are part of the preservation you are talking about. They're not mutually exclusive. It's just another element to it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara, and uh, I am uh, for the, okay. Um, uh, Anna, you have uh, reactions to what, uh, how to connect all these pieces, the active uh, civil society engagement uh, and um, the more, again, the state top-down uh, heritage professional uh, action aimed at uh, strictly protection. Um, uh, it, there is need maybe for more forum for discussing how these two things interact. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. So I would like maybe just to ask you to introduce the uh, some additional notion for cultural diplomacy. We need cultural ambassadors. So we have this experience with the High Convention and the example from Guatemala. So last year we analyzed more than sixty reports submitted by the state parties on the implementation of the, um, the, the measures to protect uh, cultural uh, sites. Uh, in this time, during the armed conflict, following uh, the, the different conflicts. And uh, one of the measures uh, coming out from this report is the examples in a uh, different country of creating this training of culture ambassadors, especially within the national army, training of military, who is the, one of the main actors during the conflict, destructing property, but also protecting them. So this is the one of the um, one of the category of the ambassadors we are preparing using the instruments we have but the forum and i will just jump on this occasion and to highlight that the next year we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the 1950 convention adopted uh, immediately after the second world war there will be a lot of uh, to continue this discussion and to develop the new policy, the action plan and roadmap for the to promote the possible peace building potential now through the uh, normative instrument, but also through the different lessons learned from the operation and project. And I use this opportunity to invite all of you to follow and to contribute to this uh, celebration, which will be the not only the the events, but also the possibility to reinforce capacity of all our actors. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will all come, of course. <laughs> and um, Valérie, a last word on how to make uh, the, how to make it work between the normative uh, uh, professional element, pro heritage professional element, and the more civil society element. They are not mutually exclusive, uh, as Tamara said. Um, some idea on how to move forward with this. No, no, just uh, I, I, like Tamara said, we need to pay attention to these different segments, you know, cultural identity protection, civil society in, in the field of culture and, and art uh, and so on. And I must confess that I was in Mosul uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, last February, and uh, uh, and I was so pleased to see that civil society uh, comes back in Mosul. And and so, I, I, I for instance, I visited a, a museum which was created by young people uh, uh, on their history, on their multicultural history. And so it gave, gave us so much hope to see that, you know, it comes from nowhere and they were there with a, a small museum, a small cafe. And so it does exist, Tamaha, you know, you can have this kind of, of, of things even in, in, in Mosul. And I'm sure that you agree with that. But, but you know, it's so um, we have to work on it. We have to, to help them. But even without us, they are ready to to be there and to 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 uh, to create this kind of initiative. Uh, no, I think sorry, you misunderstood me. I didn't say they didn't exist, but I said that there is an art ecosystem. Uh, that yes, is, yes, I understand. Yes, of course, Paris yes. is not there simply. Of course, but... of course, Paris will not be Paris with uh, without this uh, cultural ecosystem. You're right. Yes. 
Uh, I think that unfortunately our time is over, but I think that what really uh, I liked about this very uh, hectic discussion and uh, the different uh, uh, different really views from like the art field, from the more protection side, and I think that really what what uh, what it has emerged is the immense resource of cultural heritage in uh, to be mobilized really both as a in a bottom-up way, as a way to, you know, reconcile societies that are divided, uh, where civil society is actively part of this reappropriation of the public space, and on the other hand, also as a tool for top-down diplom diplomacies uh, to uh, lead the reconciliation processes, but also uh, to encourage uh, uh, reconciliation through cooperation among heritage professionals, as also Valerie was saying. So there are so many elements uh, of this human dimension of heritage that cultural diplomacy can mobilize. And I really look forward to um, follow up this discussion uh, in November uh, during the Rome Med conference. And I thank you very much for all uh, uh, participants also and speakers uh, who connected with us today. Thank you. Thank you.